questions and we will, we, we, we will continue with our session and now uh, the pro Professor Omer Bartov will uh, ha, who, who is Professor of European History at Brown University and author of nine books. His recent publications include uh, Erased, Vanished Traces of Jewish Galician Present Day in Ukraine, as well as Tales of the, from the Borderlands, Making and Unmaking the Galician Past, forthcoming July uh, 22, and prof uh, he also edited various um, uh, volumes and and, uh, on uh, re or dealing with Galician and inter-empire, so to say, territories. And Professor Bartov's today's uh, paper is entitled Tales from the Borderlands and the Fictions of History. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's very nice to there are many people I know here, unlike the previous conference I attended where I knew almost no one, so this feels much more like home. Uh, before I start, I just want to say something that had to do with the comment that uh, we made earlier, or, or two comments, which had to do with the fact that um, I think to some extent we are divided between people who know a great deal about Jewish history and people who know a great deal about non-Jewish history in this area. Uh, and part of it is... Um, institutional, um, that is that different things are being taught at different places. Um, and it reminded me of uh, something that was being said when I was still teaching at Tel Aviv University many years ago, that there were two departments. There was the Department of General History, Achug L'Histoire Klalit, and there was the Department of the History of the Jewish People, Achug L'Histoire Shel Am Israel. And when the uh, secretary at the um, uh, Department for Jewish I History would answer the phone, she would say, this is the Jewish people, hello. Can Am Israel Shalom. And so <laughs> departments are not only about departments, they seem to be also about identity. Um, now, now today, um, what I'll try to do, which is sort of impossible is to uh, give some notion of uh, the book that um, is just about to come out. I'm hoping to see copies, uh, first copies of it when I get back to the States next week, uh, called Tales from the Borderlands, Making and Unmaking the Galician Past. Um, now that book, in a sense, those of you who know my previous book, uh, Anatomy of a Genocide, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach, is what would be called in American television a prequel. Uh, and in some ways, it is made of uh, material that I researched over the last 20 years, readings and writings, many drafts of chapters that I eventually discarded when I decided to publish Anatomy of a Genocide as an anatomy of genocide, that is, as a history of how things um, um, progressed toward genocide. But of course, there was a world before genocide that did not know that genocide would happen, and that had a life of its own. And that life was an interesting life, was a valuable life, and was one that has largely been forgotten. Uh, and at the same time, it is also one that we can trace uh, the beginnings of this word, uh, Josh talks about it, uh, modernity. We can trace the beginnings of modernity to not least of all nationalism, and particularly in the case of Galicia, Ukrainian, Polish, and Jewish nationalisms, which were, of course, very closely related to each other. And we're looking over each other's shoulders and learning from each other. And Josh wrote a very important book on that. So I'm, um, I won't speak more about that. Uh, but as you may have seen from, from the uh, brief description of what I'm hoping to talk about today, uh, the book Tales from the Borderlands is also an attempt to write a first-person history uh, of um, 
a, a region and of a, a, a particular historical moment uh, in a particular mode and in a somewhat different uh, mode from the past. Now, I have used that before and again, if, we, if I can refer to my previous book, To Anatomy of a Genocide, in that book I used the large numbers of testimonies, of first-person accounts. And many of you may know that uh, historians of the Holocaust in particular have often been loath to use uh, testimonies uh, on the argument that uh, such first-person accounts, especially if they were given years after the event, um, are subjective, uh, tend to get names wrong, dates wrong, and are influenced by what has happened between the events themselves and the time that the testimony was given. Which is all true, but it also assumes the documents that come from archives, which were, say, written by SS officers, Wehrmacht officers, Gestapo personnel, or various administrators of the period are objective and can be taken at face value, which obviously they cannot, especially when they're dealing with the murder of another group. Uh, and so in writing Anatomy of a Genocide, I tried to combine both historical documents, archival documents, more traditional ones, and personal accounts so as to create what I would call a more three-dimensional uh, picture of what genocide looks like and what it looks like from below, what it looks like on the local level. Uh, that too uh, was something that I actually did not come up with. Of course, it's not my invention and I did not come up with it only in the last couple of decades. In fact, in my own early work, I tried to uh, write a history from below, what the Germans at the time called eine Geschichte von unten, uh, of the war on the Eastern Front. And again, because that war was so vast and the number of soldiers, the millions of soldiers fighting there made it impossible to write a total history of that war, uh, I did a local history, that is, I chose three German army divisions and try to get all the documents I could on them and to understand how they were indoctrinated, what, what their experience was at the front and to what extent they participated in war crimes. So that this notion of trying to write a history from below or a local history greatly informed what I was trying to do in this book as well. But there are differences. So what do I mean with uh, first-person history? Um, I'm trying to reconstruct the history of the borderlands of Eastern Europe. Obviously not all of the borderlands, but it is important to think about it as the borderlands. That is what uh, Eric, the late Eric White and a sorely missed good friend uh, and I called in a volume we edited, uh, The Shatter Zone of Empires. That is a vast area, I don't have to say too much about it to this audience, a vast area of Eastern Europe from the Baltics to the Balkans to the Black Sea in which uh, there were mixed populations living side by side and intermingling with each other, not necessarily harmoniously, but living side by side for several centuries, let's say about four centuries. Uh, so what I was trying to do in this book is to understand that period and that region um, of the shatter zone of empires before the empires shattered. In order to do that, uh, in my previous book, I chose one town. That is, I chose Buchach. In this case, I try to reconstruct that through the voices, through the accounts, uh, through the legends, the stories, the biographies of the protagonists uh, who lived at that time. Um, and I asked myself three major questions which are reflected in the structure of the book. Uh, first, I, I asked, um, 
where did these people come from? Where did people come to the borderlands from? Now that is not necessarily where they actually came from, but where they thought they came from. What stories did they tell themselves about their origins? How they had come to these places? And I'll go back to all of this in a moment. The second was, how were they transformed by that experience of living on the borderlands? How did they understand their existence in that world of mixed cultures, mixed religions over several centuries? And the third question was, where did they go to? Because the borderlands as such, as an, a, a multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, area don't exist anymore. Obviously the towns exist, obviously there are people living there. Some have memories of that, most don't. Uh, many people have memories of that, don't live there anymore, they live elsewhere. Uh, so where do they go? That is, how do they explain to themselves how they left and who they are today? And to conclude this uh, attempt, the last um, three chapters of the book, then try to trace my own family's transition from that place when it still existed in the 1930s to Palestine. Uh, and it's based uh, on an extensive uh, conversation that I had with my mother, only one, uh, but quite extensive. But of course, there's much more there than that uh, conversation. Uh, what was that transition like? Uh, what was left behind and what was created in the new place. Uh, so these are the four trajectories, I would say. Now, what is the method that I'm trying to use here, if I can call it a method? Uh, because I think I told you something about the approach. Um, first of all, what do I mean by first-person history? As I said, I think I think of it as a history told by the protagonist. Uh, now, when I speak about protagonists, I'm obviously limiting myself to a small group of people, and I'm limiting myself to Galicia, and within Galicia, I'm concentrating in large part on Buchach, on the town that I wrote on, and other towns in the region. I think of it as a history that is told not only from below, but also told from within. That is, it's a history in which the people who speak are speaking not only as, as individuals who are depicting something, but what they are depicting is a series of emotions, a series of personal recollections that they are creating their own mental, psychological world. So it is in that sense also what I would see a history from within. It is a history with a personal investment. It's a personal investment by the people who tell it. Uh, so the, the most prominent example that I can cite here, of course, uh, is an author that I refer to very often and whose name has come up here and that I greatly enjoyed, although had great difficulties with, uh, translating, and that's Shmuel Yosef Agnon, uh, who has really built an entire edifice uh, in his um, uh, posthumous book, Irum Loa, uh, an account of that world, um, albeit mostly from a Jewish perspective. So it is a uh, history with a personal inv investment. The people who tell that history are part of that history and see themselves as providing a particular prism but it's also a personal history in the sense of the historian uh, writing that history. And I was very much aware of that and my introduction of those last three chapters, that is of my own family's uh, transition, is also an introduction of myself. That is that it brings the historian, and I wasn't born there, I was born here, I was born after all of that, and yet when I went there, when I traveled there, I always had in my mind the potential that had history turned differently, had things not happened as we know they did, and as we now think they must have had, but of course they didn't have to turn out that way, I too might have grown up there. It might have been my own world. And that is 
a kind of uh, sentiment that I felt was, and, and not nostalgia, this has got nothing to do with nostalgia, but a sentiment that informed my own attempt in writing this uh, text. Uh, it's, it's a history in which I would say historical facts, and I've drawn obviously on a lot of historian facts and a lot of historiography, and I owe uh, a great debt to historians of other periods and of, and of other historiographies and languages with which I'm not as familiar as I would like to be. Uh, but it combines that with legends, with myths, with works of poetry, uh, works of fiction, uh, personal biographies, and autobiography. Um, so in that sense, it tries to, com to combine all those uh, building blocks in telling the story of that, what I call that lost world. So in a sense, I would say that uh, if, if I try now to describe to you how the book works, uh, it is made up of these four parts, and I'm going to give you just a few uh, quick um, points, and then I'll focus on a number of them. So in the first part, which I call, Where Did We Come From?, but I also call With Fire and Sword, and I'm sure that some of you are familiar with the title, uh, I speak first of all about origins, about tales of origins. Uh, the tales of origins that I uh, touch on most, uh, one that is, called, that is uh, told by uh, Sadok Baranch, uh, who was a historian uh, in the late 19th century, a uh, Dominican priest of Armenian origin, who among other things wrote a history of Buchach based in large part on documents that no longer exist, and was a very strong Catholic and describes this entire world as the spread of Catholicism into the wild lands of the East. And the second story of origins uh, is a story of origins told by uh, Agnon. And of course, Agnon told that story twice. He told it uh, very uh, later on in life in his book, uh, Irum Loa, about the origins of Buchach, but he told it also when he was a young man uh, in uh, 1917 as a story of the origins of East European Jewry. And that is a story of how East Europe, of how Ashkenazi uh, Jewry, uh, the Rhinelanders, came to Eastern Europe as they were making the way to Eretz Israel and why they decided to spend the night there for the following four centuries. Uh, so that is another story of origins which places the origins of that city of Buchach uh, as the origins of East European Jewry, as the origins of all the cities and as he sees it, the, the single most important civilization, the Jewish civilization in Eastern Europe. Uh, I go on from there to tell the this, this stories in this where we came from, uh, the story of the Cossack uprising of, of Bohdan Khmelnytsky. I draw, of course, a lot on uh, Nathan Hanover. Uh, we just talked about uh, Hanover's Hebrew. This, of course, was a text written in Hebrew in the 17th century that is accessible to any modern Hebrew reader. Uh, uh, that tale of origins uh, and I tell the story of what I call uh, divine justice. Divine justice in the sense of the destruction uh, at the end uh, of that period by the Ottoman occupation. And that's the story told with the destruction of the city of Buchach itself, which withstood uh, the Cossack armies, but was conquered and destroyed uh, by the Ottomans and then rebuilt in the 18th century the edifices we see there uh, were largely built in the 18th century after uh, the city was rebuilt. In the second part on uh, what did we become, which I also call uh, faith and reason, um, I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, in one chapter, which I call Stones and Souls, I talk about the story of the establishment of the city hall. Uh, 
Now, Buchach has a very famous uh, city hall, Ratush or Ratusha. Uh, there is, a, Agnon tells the story of the city hall. Uh, some Agnon uh, specialists have argued with me about that because they believe that he really did research on that, which he did for the book. But the story he tells is um, a, a complete fantasy, but a very interesting one. Uh, and it is, it is a story that ascribes the uh, creation of the city hall to a Jewish architect, a crypto Jew who discovers that he's a Jew while he's building the city hall uh, of Buchach. Uh, and in many ways, it's a story that tries to explain uh, why the Jews of Buchach loved the city hall, although that city hall had a whole series of sculptures that they were not supposed to admire, and yet they did. Um, of course, that is not uh, the actual uh, origin of the city hall. I'll, I'll touch of, on that in a, in a minute. I then talk about uh, what I call communities of spirit, and especially the rise of Hasidism in that area. Uh, and among other things, um, I, and I'm sure that some of you know this well, uh, I... Um, go on a journey along with Agnon in his long story in this book of Mechapsim Laim Rav, uh, looking for a rabbi, which in some ways is the last moment before modernity comes to that area. It's the, uh, it, is, it is a story filled with uh, um, 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 magic, if, if, to, to put it plainly, with magical rabbis, with magic, with um, um, uh, the supernatural uh, reign supreme uh, in that story, as the city cannot find for itself a rabbi, it lost its rabbi through also a highly complex uh, plot. Uh, I then talk about the arrival of the empire, and we were just talking about that earlier. I wanted to mention that there is a, a very important book by uh, Jakob Braver uh, um, uh, co called um, uh, Als Österreich nach Galicien kam, uh, which was his PhD dissertation. He finished that, I think it was 21 years old, or 26, sorry, he was 26, and it was published in... 1911, I think, just before he left uh, Austria, the Austrian Empire, and went to Palestine. Uh, and it, it describes the attempts by the Austrian Empire to rationalize this area, first of all, to understand the area that they took over, and then to rationalize it. Uh, and, but I won't go into all those details now. Uh, what I'm interested in there uh, with when the empire came uh, is the, it, again, just to give you an example, is again one of the stories uh, that Agnon uh, writes in Irum Loa uh, called The Disappeared, Haneelam. Some of you may know it. Uh, do, do people know it here? Uh, okay, it's a, it's a beautiful story. I wish I could, uh, but please read it. It's available now in an English translation in a book edited by the late Alan Mintz. Um, uh, it's very hard to translate, but it's a story about Austrian conscription. Uh, a, a, a Jewish boy from Buchach is conscripted. He's conscripted because he's poor, and so the community that doesn't have volunteers basically forces him to join the Austrian army. When he comes back from the Austrian army, he disappears. He never comes home. And finally, he is discovered, and he has been enslaved uh, and unmanned by a local uh, noble woman. Um, and it, when he's discovered and brought back to Buchach, he finally withers and dies. So it's a story very much about the encounter of um, a, a, a traditional, not well-educated, but very handsome uh, young Jewish man, um, and very masculine uh, young Jewish man, uh, the encounter of such a man with the outside world and the fact that uh, the Jewish community is surrounded by something threatening and that threat is what takes away from him both his religion, his identity, his gender um, and ultimately his humanity so that when he comes back he is soulless. Uh, and that is how he, he withers and dies. So uh, 
it's what I try to do with that is to speak about that encounter with the new world that comes with the Austrian Empire. Um, um, the the last point that I talk about uh, in this section is what I call how to love a child, and that also touches on issues that were raised uh, earlier. Uh, that's um, the issue of education. Uh, and of course it has to do with uh, Homburg schools, and there was a Homburg school in, in Buchach that lasted a few years, had a couple of hundred students. Uh, it also has to do with uh, Pearl's attempts uh, at um, uh, Haskalah schooling. Um, um, but, but what interests me in this is the extent to which uh, criticism of uh, Jewish schooling by um, uh, Maskilim, uh, and I analyze a particular text that is not very, very, very well known, uh, raises many of the points about uh, pre-modern Jewish schooling that comes later on also in anti-Semitic writings about Jews. Uh, that is that it is uh, demeaning to uh, uh, the children, that it um, closes them uh, from the world, that it erects wars between them and their Gentile environment. Uh, so there is an entire discourse over the humanity of Jews within the world in which they're both integrated and at the same time segregated from. Um, in the last part, I talk of uh, where did we go? And um, again, I can't go into uh, all the details here, but the, the first part I talk about the fiction of history. And uh, here I speak about uh, some uh, writers that I, um, influential writers um, that I find fascinating uh, and useful for this exercise. Uh, so um, I begin with the Taras Shevchenko. Uh, and, and his poetry, since I'm run of, of time, I'll just talk about it right now. Um, um, especially his poem, Haidamaki, uh, uh, and especially within that, Gonta in Uman. And what is fascinating in, in that poem and what is relevant, I think, to uh, what I'm trying to get at uh, is that in that poem, um, uh, Gonta uh, encounters uh, his own children uh, who were born to a Catholic Polish woman. Polish Catholic is the same thing within this context. And goaded by his own men uh, who remind him of his oath uh, to kill the Catholics, he slaughters his own children. Uh, it's, it's a hair-raising uh, moment in the poem uh, but what is, um, um, and it's beautifully written, uh, um, but what is important in it, uh, if we look at it from a later perspective, is that it has to do with the need to tear the Ukrainian nation out of the grasp or the, the combination with Poland. That one has to create it by separating the two. And the separation can only be done with the sword, with blood and sword. Um, and, and that, in fact, in some ways, uh, tragically, was reenacted in mixed uh, Polish-Ukrainian villages uh, in the course of World War II. Uh, killings that happened within families, Polish and Ukrainian mixed families, where the boys were raised in the father's religion and the girls in the mother's religion, so that the so-called ethnic difference remained from one generation to the next. I then talk uh, about um, Ivan Franco, who is also a highly influential writer. And what uh, interests me here in particular is again that in Franco's writing, uh, he was very interested in uh, Galician Jews. Um, he, he knew many Galician Jews. He was also influenced by Marxism, by socialism rather. Um, and uh, in, in his writing, you see again the need to create a separation this time between the emerging Ukrainian nation, the Polish um, 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 landlords, the Polish uh, aristocracy, the um, um, city rulers, and the Jews. 
And the Jews are seen repeatedly as those who are bloodsuckers living off the Ukrainian peasantry. That is, by the way, the return of the Jews to the countryside after the emancipation of the Jews. So um, we talked about it earlier, but the, uh, because of the Austrian reforms, initially, many Jews have to move back into the cities. And that creates these congested ghettos. After the emancipation in the 1860s, Jews start moving back into the villages. That is also after the serfs have been emancipated. So there's growing friction between Jews and Ukrainians, and that is the time of the rise of Ruthenian slash Ukrainian nationalism, uh, which is trying to create an image of an independent um, uh, Ukrainian nation. Uh, and the Jews are seen as those who are poisoning it, not least with alcohol, with um, the, the, the tavern is the sort of most uh, potent symbol. Um, Professor Bartov, excuse yes, me. Yes, okay. I'm, uh, sorry, I'm, I knew it would happen. So I'm, I'm just going to uh, very quickly end on uh, two, two notes. One is that um, the, the last writer in this batch that I talk about is uh, Karl Emil Franzos. And uh, Franzos is a writer of that generation. And he, um, uh, his own image of himself is uh, one who leaves the shtetl. He comes from Chortkov near um, Bucha, Ch Chortkiv now, uh, and who becomes a German writer. And he writes about um, um, uh, uh, Asia, what, uh, 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 what he calls halb Asian, half Asia, to explain it to German readers. And he becomes a very popular writer uh, explaining that world of the Jews in the shtetl uh, in German to German audiences. He's translated also into English. And he believes in Jewish integration into, uh, not assimilation, but integration into uh, German society. Um, and it, to think of him and Franco together side by side as trying to create a, an image of what that world is, uh, is um, uh, highly enlightening. And I'm, I'll finish just with um, um, the, the, the last um, uh, story that I want to tell you. Uh, some of you will be familiar with that. There is a um, beautiful novel by Agnon uh, called uh, A Guest for the Night. And uh, it was published in 1939. It was based on his visit to Buchach in 1930. Um, um, and, it, and, and obviously, I guess for the night, uh, echoes with the idea of the Jews uh, stopping Pauline in Poland for the night and staying for several centuries. What is interesting in the story is that there are characters in the story that are historical characters, uh, and uh, some of them are the people who left Buchach. So there's a very interesting encounter in this novel um, between a man called uh, um, uh, uh, Schutzling and the protagonist. Uh, and this Schutzling is an anarchist who comes back also to visit his hometown. He left a long time ago. Uh, this man is actually Max Nacht. He's a, a character from Buchach. Uh, and, and what's fascinating in this encounter is that you have two uh, individuals who left the borderlands for different reasons. One, as they say, for Zionism, and the other for anarchism. One wanted to bring a revolution that never happened. One went to build Zionism, and Agnon is rather disenchanted with that. And that encounter is, it, although it's fictionalized, it is actually, it I would say, embodies this moment of departure from a world that no longer, no longer exists, from which people went to change the world, were changed through that process of trying to change the world, oops, uh, and eventually um, created a world that brought about the destruction of the very world they had come from, the destruction of that very uh, borderlands uh, that they had left. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Sorry uh, for taking much, too I'm long. So, I, I, I'm sorry to no, no, disturb you, but would, would this very... It's extremely interesting, but we, well, we, we have, now we have time for questions. Professor Magotti. 
uh, actually, listening to you today, um, the, you are trained as a historian, but this is the, the, what you've been doing, and certainly here, this is historical anthropology, or anthropology uh, informed, by, uh, informed by history. And uh, I'm going to lead to the ultimate question. Uh, but, uh, your, your title here, is this the title that you've given to the paper, also reflective of the title of the book? The, the title of the book is Tales from the Borderlands, uh, making and unmaking the Galician past. Ah, okay, so, so you got Galicia different. in there because here yeah. we don't know where these borderlands are. Okay. But uh, based, on, uh, based on what you've just said, we've, we've, uh, we've, you know, we figured this out. Um, d d talking about borderlands, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind, of course, we had the Franco-Germanic borderlands, Luxembourg, Alsace, Germanic Slavic borderlands, Kashubia, uh, uh, Bohemia, uh, the Balkan European versus Ottoman influence along the Drava Sava rivers, and then within that, all kinds of borderlands. Really, what I'm get, getting at here, what makes the area around Buchac mm -hmm. a borderland? Mm -hmm. Or what makes it any different from any other portion of that area? and many other areas of Europe, in comparison to those that I've just mentioned, which one can kind of see real clear differences, uh, is the borderlands that you're talking about an internal mental one? Uh, is it borderlands just simply because it's made up of different populations and languages and religions, which makes it hardly unique throughout Europe and certainly not unique in Central uh, and Eastern Europe? And then the very term borderland. How do you understand borderland? Is a, is, is a borderland that area of something where civilization ends and then there is nothing after it, whether in terms of civilization or population? Uh, or, or is a borderland a nondescript area between several civilizations? So what, how do you understand borderland and then what makes this borderland so important, mm -hmm. or somehow a borderland, other than the fact that you have decided, because of your persona, as well as your anthropological approach, and then anything can be a borderland? Mm -hmm. let, let us gather questions, please. Any other? Well, I'm trying to gather voices. Is there not other than Professor? Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned uh, earlier um, uh, the book that Eric White and I edited uh, called Chatter Zone of Empires, uh, where we actually... Well, I was a participant. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, and, and you came to a number of the meetings uh, where we, we speak about the peculiarities of that area, not the area of Buchac, but the area of Eastern Europe's borderlands. Uh, what is interesting about that entire area, that I'm interested in Buchach, but it, it could be many, many other towns and cities, uh, is that those are areas that were ruled by, for several centuries, by large multi-ethnic uh, imperial entities that were not um, uh, defined by a particular ethnicity, uh, and that in that area especially, uh, they, um, they, they rubbed against each other. So you have hundreds of towns along that area that had mixed populations. Uh, many of them had also large concentrations of Jews in them, uh, among others. Um, so that is the, the, the geographical area that I'm interested in, is this area of meeting of empires. Uh, which is, I would say, uh, somewhat different from other areas you mentioned. The second thing that is important is that all of this comes crashing down in World War I. And in the aftermath of World War I, uh, this is the area where a whole array of new nation states are created. And those are nation states that want to be uh, homogeneous, ethnically, nationally, often religiously, but are not, because they all have very large minorities. And so 
the, the rise of nationalism in that area, which begins in the late 19th century and then comes into actual political expression after World War I, um, is a dynamic that eventually brings about a great deal of violence in World War II and the complete destruction of that borderland. That is, in the sense that the geography remains there, but what had distinguished this area, which was the mix of populations and religions and cultures, which overlapped with each other, which were informed by each other, which created something that was different from, in, from the heartlands of those very same empires that no longer exists. And not only does it not exist, but um, it, its memory, uh, if there is any, um, often exists elsewhere. It does not exist there anymore uh, because those areas were largely homogenized uh, and much of what they had been uh, is a disruptive memory that one would rather not have. So uh, this is what I have in mind. Now, that it produced um, um, a great deal of interesting literature that was about that, that was constantly talking about that, that it produced um, 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 a particular type of nationalisms. Um, um, because of this mix. That, of course, also makes it interesting to me, uh, but that is what I think is the sort of, so it is mental, if you like, yes. It's inter-ethnic, uh, um, and it was especially creative. And the way I understand it, um, many of the people who left those areas, Excuse uh, me. Yeah, uh, many of the people who left those areas um, were, in that sense, uh, particularly creative individuals. I, I didn't go through the whole list. Um, and I think that their creativity, that moment of uh, creative energy, has to do with their coming from that mixed world that was, no one knew it, but although there were fears, but that was about to uh, disappear. And they were, in that sense, harbingers of modernity. Uh, and the world they bring into being is not the world that they wanted to have, but that they feared would happen. <laughs>